Uh, welcome to The Revolution Will Be Humanized, The Glass Age Approaches. Uh, we are streaming this live on May 27th. Uh, we are gathered here because Alexander Hayes contacted me and said, hey Jeff, would you like to, would you be interested in streaming a conversation about some stuff? And I said, Ooh. yeah, that sounds interesting. Uh, and so we have a bunch of people gathered here, possibly some more coming in to talk about what stuff, Alexander? Well, what we did do is we did talk about, um, well, we posed a series, I posed a series of questions and I hope that perhaps we could um, just sort of move through those one by one and see where things are heading because they start off really talking more broadly about technology and then narrow down into a specific type of technological, um, it's not an invention, it's been around for 25 years or so. Uh, but really the onset of that particular type of wearable technology. So uh, the first question that I well, posed was, yeah, before we do. Before we I, do. Yeah, I'm wondering if we can kind of set the table a little bit and provide some overview, <laughs> okay. because I think yeah. uh, people who live in the world that you live in assume certain things that others might not be aware of. And well, what entirely. this stuff entirely. is, is kind of wearable technology. Uh, Google Glass has been released and is gaining some traction. There's a big conference mm -hmm. in, in Toronto. Um, I'm wondering if you can take just a, a couple minutes and tell us about the technology that we're talking about, uh, where it's at now, and where it's likely to head. Okay. Uh, for the last 25 years or so, there's been a number of lead innovators who have looked at um, technologies which can uh, enhance, can capture, and can interact with uh, our immediate environment. Uh, those in, those particular technologies are specific to your eyes and ever increasingly to your brain. So and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but right on cue, Steve Mann has joined us, and I want to say uh, welcome and thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. Hello, and thank you for having me here. I can only be on briefly because I have a meeting with the chair at 10.30 EDT. And because but, of that... Uh, Alexander, if you don't mind, <laughs> I'm going to no, uh, give Steve take. the job of answering that question, uh, which was I, I'm asking him to kind of set the table a little bit about this discussion because I know some of you live in this world of, of wearable technology, and Steve, you've been living there for a long time and wearing things on your face for a long time. I'm, I'm wondering if you can give us your take on where we are in the curve of wearable technology, uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about these kinds of things. Okay, I guess there's two things. One thing is, um, well, first, if, I presume you've probably read the interaction design article on wearable computing that summarizes a lot of these issues. Um, there's I can, issues. I can, I can provide that. Steve, your camera is pointing at your workshop. Ah, that's better. <laughs> we could we could see your hair, but nothing more. Yeah, I, I'm actually not wearing my mic, so I'm just sort of leaning over to speak into the mic here. Okay. But the the um, I should put my iTap camera on the feed too, but the um, please, please do. The the thing that I think is important is the main issue is sort of uh, aug augmented reality. You know, the the mm. idea when as soon as you're wearing a camera, you see augmented reality. It has three things. It has a a, a wearable camera. I call it a wear cam. It has a wearable computer. I call it a wear comp, and it has a wearable display. I call it a wear disc. And that creates something that we call augmented reality, which is uh, a, a sort of smart AR or, or intelligent AR that is sensitive to its surroundings or environment. It's not just a wearable display, like a private eye type reflection technologies display over one eye isn't really AR, although a lot of people call it that. So I prefer to sort of make the distinction of augmented reality as a sort of um, intermediary where the computer serves as an intermediary. One of the things that that necessarily raises is the issue of valence, because you're wearing a camera. And this is kind of what I found over the last 35 years of wearing glass, mm -hmm. that a lot of people um, uh, were freaked out by it. I mean, in my childhood, I kind of invented this as a, a computerized welding glass. Uh, in welding, we, see, we look through a dark glass to see everything. Not usually glass, it's just one piece of glass and we look through the dark glass and it helps us see by simply diminishing the reality around us. And I realized 
that what we need to be able to do is to augment or diminish, in other words, augmentate the reality as an intermediary, not just augment and add new things to clutter our lives, but to actually fulfill the main vision of glass. Uh, when I when we were using glass in the weld shop, you know, the purpose there was to help people see better. I, I learned to weld when I was about four years old. Uh, my grandfather taught me, and so I understood the idea of seeing better by looking through glass. And but the thing is, what I wanted was glass that would uh, augment the darker areas of the image and diminish the brighter areas of the image, and, and overlay also computer graphics and text and things like that. So then that necessarily is glass that has to have a camera and a display and a processor and so as a result this brings us valence I mean surveillance is watching from above where you have a camera that watches over people the way that police watch a suspect but the conference that we're having with the IEEE the IEEE ice test is on the theme of augmented reality and wearable computing in everyday life which is necessarily not surveillance, but just valence. Valence mm -hmm. means watching, and surveillance means watching from above. And I think that the theme that we have to really talk about, the thing that everybody's freaking out about over the last 35 years when I started wearing this glass, is the camera that's in it and how that impacts on life. And at first I was just building this to help myself and others see better. But then I realized after being you know, physically assaulted simply for wearing a camera to try to see better, uh, a lot of people said, lawyers and everything said, oh, you better keep a record of everything that's on that camera so that you can use it in court against the perpetrator. Mm. Which which I saw you did. I was reading your post on the incident at uh, McDonald's in, in France. Um, since our time is limited, I hope you don't mind if I jump ahead to sort of core questions. You mentioned the uh, ISTAS 13 conference, which is coming up next month in Toronto, and these issues are going to be uh, prominent, the issues of privacy and how to deal with all this valence in our world. What are, what's the debate going to be? So yes, there are concerns about privacy and what, wh how are things going to line up? Are there, is it going to be corporations against open content people? Who, what, what are the sides of the argument going to be? Actually, it's not really a clear 20th century us versus them argument. It is not surveillance by the police against citizens doing surveillance. You see, people often misunderstood surveillance and surveillance with a 20th century us versus them to say that surveillance is inverse surveillance and surveillance is the police watching citizens and the shopkeeper watching shoppers and surveillance is the, the citizens watching the police and shoppers watching shopkeepers. But rather, I think that the more modern definition of surveillance is the capture and sensing or recording or processing of activity by a participant in the activity as sensed by a participant in the activity. So the issues, I think the key fundamental issues are one is the, uh, principles like the sensory entitlement principle. Actually, if you look at the valence paper, wherecam.org slash valence slash valence dot pdf, that's a paper that we've entitled valence part one. That lays out all of these issues. And the issues are um, um, mainly a matter, things like sensory entitlement. Does somebody else have entitlement over one's own senses? If one's wearing a glass to help see better and somebody demands that you take it off, then maybe that person becomes liable if you trip and fall because you took off the glass and suddenly changed how you're understanding and seeing the world. The other, um, the other issues are, I mean, there's the issues of valence and there's also the issues of ITAP criteria. Does it meet the ITAP criteria? Is it going to actually help people see better or is it just going to confuse people and cause them to bump into walls and things like that and though those criteria like the camera has to be the eye the camera can't be offset from the eye if the camera is away from the eye immediately you've gone down to generation one glass which causes all kinds of problems the camera has to be the eye itself mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if you don't mind a, another tech question, because you've been experimenting with this stuff for quite a long time, and it seems like you've had a lot of features years ago of that that is not available yet. Things like face recognition and uh, the spectral uh, options. Uh, what's your take on this first version of Google Glass, and how quickly do you think this is going to develop? How would you like to see it develop? Well, the, the, this first is what we call a generation one glass. 
And this is what we did back in the 70s, is to have a camera hooked to a wearable computer, wearable camera, wearable display, and see through the camera. But the camera wasn't the eye itself. And this caused a lot of problems. I tried it uh, down below, where you look down to see it. I tried it up above, where you look up to see it. And I tried it straight ahead, where you look straight ahead to see it. And wherever you put it is kind of irrelevant. But the main central issue is that you've got this eye that's outside your eye socket. And so it's disorienting. It causes, it sort of, you get this effect where neural pathways are developed in the brain to overcompensate for this strange mapping. And so what I did to break that cycle and cause, and, and, and to stop it from giving me a massive headache was I just flipped the image upside down so that it forced me to adapt to very, very different mapping rather than one that was close to the identity. Because whenever the mapping was close to the identity, I was banging at the walls. And it kind of started to screw up my mind a little bit. So I, I found if I rotated the image 90 degrees or turned it upside down, it left, right. It made all that go away because it was so disorienting as to not confuse it with reality. And then after a little while, I adapted to it. So that was the first thing I discovered. But then the second thing. I discovered how to make a new generation called two digital eyeglass. We used to call this digital eyeglass kind of like a welding glass, um, but digital compute computational. And the generation two glass caused the eye itself to become both the camera and the display. And so that was the next step. And then the problem with that is that one eye was focused differently than the other because the tapped eye, if you have a single eye tap, was focused maybe at one depth, and the untapped eye was focused at a different depth. So then the next thing was generation three glass, which tracks the focus. And then finally, generation four glass, which has infinite depths of focus, what we call laser eye tap. Mm -hmm. um, I know our, our time with you is, is running out, and I want to give other people a chance for a question. I, I have to ask the question. I've seen this on your, your blog posts, but why is Steve Mann I, to, are you involved in Google Glass at all? If not, it seems odd that you're not. Why? Why would that be? Um, it's an interesting question. Maybe uh, maybe we can uh, get some discussion on that. It, it's a deep question. I mean, a lot of my students are working there, um, and a lot of my students uh, have been approached, and some of them are working there, and some of them uh, have stayed. Uh, I've got. We started a number of other companies and so on along the way. And so, like we have Interaxon, which is uh, uses our brainwave technology to. Uh, so we have this product called the Muse, which reads uh, brainwaves. And and uh, so some of my students are running that, and some of those students have, uh, and various other students have been approached by Google. So there's a lot going on here, and um, there's probably a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, that uh, um, life is stranger than fiction, I guess, and. Um, I have to go in about 30 seconds, so I don't know if there's any, um, maybe we'll meet up at ISTAS, and, and I hope that all of you will be able to come to ISTAS. And uh, we have Ray Kurzweil and Marvin Minsky and myself giving this uh, opening keynote, and then we have a bunch of other speakers. We've got uh, Gordon Bell from, from Microsoft and a bunch of other uh, speakers. Some really good speakers will be coming, and uh, we've also, we're going to touch on really drill right down into actually these core issues. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who are not going, we hope we're going to be able to either tune in live or catch the recordings in some kind of open content way, but we're not sure we are. Well, there'll be a lot of us with ITAP, Generation 4 glass, so um, that might help at least give some vestiges. But you know, the power of being there and actually meeting face-to-face -face all these wonderful people, I think it should not be overlooked. Mm -hmm. Of course not, but but so nice to have uh, you know a stream, uh, you know a little bit of uh, valence on the conference itself, uh, brought out to us. So we'd appreciate it. Yes. You can lobby so for it. Do so. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I've got I've got to run now, but uh, I might join back on if there's uh, I don't know how long this will run for, but I'll check in and at least be on online in some way or another. All right, great. Thanks, Thank you Steve. very much, Steve. Yeah. Thanks Absolutely. for joining us, Steve. Uh, and I want to say hello to Maria, has joined, who has joined us. Hello, Maria. Hi, Maria. Hello. Uh, Thank you for having me. Delighted you could join us. Uh, Alex, before we get back to the questions, is there anything you wanted to follow up on what uh, Steve had said? 
Uh, just one. Uh, I've added a number of chat posts into the chat area. Uh, the last, the very last link I've put in there a moment ago, uh, is is quite pertinent, I think, to think of this in, in context of the actual event itself, which is. <coughs> Can you imagine going to a conference where the lanyard itself um, is, in actual fact, a camera which is pointing and recording at every other person? So I've put the link in there, and you can see that uh, Nelly, the speakers, were in the T Toronto conference. That's correct. I'll put the chats back there. Yes, Maybe, Cam. Well, that surveillance camera is pointing at every single other delegate that's in that environment. And what that might mean for the behaviours of the people that are in that particular environment itself. So when you say that you'd like to see some data that's coming from that, uh, that event, we will, most oh, definitely. Yeah. It'll be spread liberally across the web. Whether it's live or not, it's a different matter. I'd like to see that there were some live points in there that people could hook in. And I think this is this is a classic example that we can use Google Hangout this way and stream it out, and that's been the um, the focus of the organising committee is to try and push that forward. Uh, can you tell us a little these... bit more about mm. why this conference? I, I get a sense this is a really important conference, not just by its its nature and who gets invited, but somehow the the timing of it that something special is going to happen, uh, or have I misperceived that? No, I think you're quite correct. Um, uh, within the next six to 12 months, there will be a large release of a number of different devices or technologies that will uh, be seen and will be seen to be um, changing the way that we interpret the internet to be. Um, the examples are the Momoto camera. Uh, so if you go to momoto.com, go to autographer. worn essentially around the chest or breastbone, either, clip, either clipped to your clothing or worn like a pendant on your neck. Um, they're fairly innocuous looking devices, they're fairly featureless, but essentially they're a camera and sensor based device that takes any number of different types of sensing uh, from, uh, from reacting to the to light to pedometers to monitoring your heart to monitoring your step pace camber um, gait all of these different data sets as well as taking a photo every four or five seconds so if you can imagine at the end of the day uh, having access to photos that have been taking taken every four to five seconds from your chest bone from this sort of position here forward as well as Google Glass, which is uh, an augmented uh, overlay, as well as uh, the ability to take photos and video, um, they are definitely going to have a, a difference in the way that we interpret data. So the data that will come forward from those activities will start to become uh, quite uh, permeated across the, the internet. And you're starting to see some now with um, applications like Lite, uh, Vine.co, and a series of other uh, short um, burst uh, videos that can be bite-sized tweets spread liberally and quickly across environments. So the way you know, that people will behave will be different. While we're talking about the gear, Steve kind of touched on the, the design aspect. You know, he was saying when you have the the view angle off uh, your main normal vision, it can be very disorienting and cause eye strain. And some of yeah. the designs I thaw, saw were more like, they just looked like Terminator sunglasses, which seems to me that if, if the interface was right in front of your eye, it would be a little bit, not only might you avoid that eye strain, but you might socially seem a little bit less strange. It would just look like you're wearing glasses. Indeed. Uh, th so uh, the idea is you meant also might have noted that Steve was using the term org mediated. He wasn't using the term augmented. So when we drill down on what he means by org mediated, uh, 
essentially it's an, it's the ability to see through and interact with real life lifetime objects uh it's a filter that can also preclude um um you know ads or can inter, inter intervene with certain surfaces that you're interacting with so if you can imagine and i saw it really saw it really well demonstrated at the ar camp recently here at cambria university in australia if you think about it currently we have a qr code but we have to with our hands essentially grab a technology of some description and and uh place it over the QR code or in the field of view of the QR code in order for our device to interact with that particular QR, uh, QR code, which by the way are very butt ugly. So if you can imagine that if you're not having to hold something in your hand, it's become a wearable technology and it's within your a visual uh, field of view, you'll be interacting with all sorts of different fields and your world the layers of the things that you see in an everyday context will, will markedly differ to Yet that of having to pull the thing out of your out of your hand, out of your pocket or hold the iPad up in the air. Or... Yet at the same time, as I was watching these interface videos, I found myself thinking, I kind of want a hand control because you watch these Google Glass videos, and you know, okay, wearing a strange device is one thing, but walking around saying, okay, Google, take a picture okay, good, <laughs> is, is even stranger. Whereas if, like, mm. I can imagine, like, a little ring joystick or something where you could mm. control the device. Well, I mean, you think about the way you drive a car, right? One foot uses a brake, you know, one foot on the gas, and you've got a hand on a stick shift. And the, if you had to give vocal commands to all of those different machines, it would be a bit more challenging. I mean, we do have other body parts that are helpful. <clears throat> I'd like to, to go back uh, just on a couple of points there. One of them is about how the social weirdness of the process. I don't think that we've had a better example of social weirdness than people adapting to their phone technologies mm. and the sort of change in eye direction and all that stuff. So I, I don't think that's a particularly big challenge. I think that as long as people are being honest about the fact that they're wearing wearable devices and they're entering into the social contract with that kind of honesty, I don't think that's going to be any different than people making sidelong glances at the phone under the table. Um, the that's the, the other thing that I... Sure. Go ahead. No, go ahead. On just on that one point, if I may, um, uh, Steve's very, very keen to point out that these cameras that are worn, like the autographer and the Momoto camera, are worn as an honesty pendant. Uh, so, if you think of the terminology of honesty pendant, what it is doing is an extension of the way that you're surveilling the environment or surveilling the environment for your own purpose not for the purpose of a consortium or a, a government. Right. But the, the question the other point, that arose, yeah, from that. The other point that I wanted to raise is, uh, I, I was imagining, let's say, 500 people at this conference all with wearable devices recording things. Um, having been involved in really massive amounts of uh, sort of events with lots and lots and lots of people doing stuff, um, getting recordings of things is never a problem. Curation is always the problem. Mm -hmm. So if you have... If, if you look at a conference now, there's, you know, 500 times more things recorded than there would have been 15 years ago because everybody's carrying a recording device in their pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, but they only pull it out at certain times and only certain people do it. If we yeah. imagine everybody doing that at the same time, how are we possibly going to curate any of this? So that okay, it's well, So it's useful. If you can imagine a visual timeline uh, where if I could say to you at 11.20 yesterday, I lost my keys somewhere or other. So it was around about 11, 11.20. So I can zoom back visually from my perspective as to what I was doing at that particular point. So zooming back across that body of content digitally is very, very fast, very rapid, easy to do. But um, that's for me. I mean when you've got five, 500 people doing it. Personally, I can totally understand how that'd be helpful. I lose my keys five times a day. But <laughs> I mean, when you've got, it's the scale part of this, because it's always the scale that kills every one of these projects. So yeah, it is, it is. And the scale, scale was, I'll put into the chat there about SenseCam, the Microsoft uh, project, which is run for a long time, uh, where they decided to cut audio off because of the cultural um, 
permissions around uh, privacy and security that were revealed uh, when audio was connected with visual environment. But uh, they are, from what I understand, that scalability in the nature of uh, drillability and rediscoverability and reusability of content is being mastered quite quickly. So the algorithms and the ability to drill visual imagery, images and also geolocation, particularly geolocation of when, where something happened. Let me pose a scenario quickly. Imagine if, for instance, the Boston bombings occurred, uh, they were able to tap into everybody's perspective at that particular point in time, or even maybe 300 people's perspectives of the geolocated uh, uh, camera-based data that was wearable at that particular perspective. Not just what was handheld, but not what was in video format, but from, from where people were currently engaging with uh, from their body. Uh, the, the situation would be, again, closer and probably even more accurate and quicker. So uh, that's in a surveillance mode, but in a surveillance mode or in a, a pointing back, perhaps that would be very useful for our own memory and perhaps it'll be very useful for any number of different reasons. And that's the point of this particular conversation tonight, to explore what those apprehensions might be, those usefulness, uh, those perspectives or social engagement spaces. All right, I think we've, we've laid the table. I think we've talked tech, we've talked terminology. Uh, let's get to kind of the, the benefits and concerns. And let's start with the benefits. Uh, you've suggested a couple. What else is, is uh, the bright side of this coin? Uh, well, as I have been involved in this space for uh, since 2003, four, uh, and that's, you know, I'm a newcomer in, in the context of the MIT Cyborg Lab, the Perceptual Computing Group, HCI across the world in general. Um, Benefits I can see in just about every single trade area that there is um, in that people by their own choice can, can quickly record actions from the perspective of the point of view of the wearer and can easily transmit that data set across to another learner in, who is trying to master a certain type of task or other. The way that we currently do that is that we um, need to be there physically to demonstrate how something is is achieved. Uh, we then have to reverse in our own mind, as Steve was saying earlier, he, his whole reversal of, of image is part of the way he, he um, remains, uh, you know, marginally sane. Uh, it's about um, how you can um, capture record, transmit, digest, and re-emulate something in a way that I think is useful, that I'm interested in, in an educational context. And that is both augmented, or mediated, and also just straight uh, data capture, audio, video, from the perspective, from the first person perspective. So for me, the benefits are firstly to think about if I take something from the first person perspective, what does it do for my own thinking? What does it do for the person who I'm trying to transmit or to convince that this is the correct way to do something? And how relevant is that within the context of that particular um, person's life? Anybody else want to chime in with the reasons to be excited? Well, I, I have a perspective. Hi, my name's Rob. Hi, Rob. Um, Hi, Rob. You mentioned a, a few things uh, along the way there, the benefits, you know. I see, I, I saw a, a, a university campus guy driving by with a Segway the other day, and I took my mm -hmm. iPad and I started to hang out. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I, I do humorous things. So this is my... Uh, this is my harmonica holder, so I've created a Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. and then I would attach this to it. So if pe this this kind of deals with that issue of, uh, are you? So this is a, a media device. Yes. So so, I think that people will have different types of wearable items. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Yeah. Uh, somebody said they worked with earlier said they worked with uh, visors for welding helmets, and this is a uh, you know just attaching different types of, of wearable devices for different reasons. Mm -hmm. All of mine happen to be less than five bucks. That's all, mm -hmm. and that's why I find it kind of humorous using you know just existing devices. Mm -hmm. Kudos so for so I see part of benefits for marketing, benefits marketing uh, education. Uh, I can uh, I can do my consulting from in the world mm -hmm. um, instead of doing it uh, as we're doing right now. You can see what I see uh, when I teach people languages, international languages. Uh, they go to the Walmart with me. They go to the farmers market with me. They experience with me, not look at don't look at me. Look at what I see. Mm -hmm. so. That's a good point. And that's the first uh, way that I came in contact with this. I was in a very remote part of Australia. I was, um, I met a person who had, was wearing a video camera on their head and a small DVR recorder on their hip. They happened to be underneath a car uh, in a very confined space recording uh, aspects of a particular mechanical type of behaviour and then after they had finished their task, they would then cut the video into short segments and transmit that by Bluetooth to their students. That allowed the students to get into that uh, remote location. What have you got there, Bob? <laughs> this is a 99 cent Swiffer with a piece of Velcro on it, which I attach oh, yeah. a, a cell phone to. Yeah. And then I push it underneath my vehicle and say, how do I fix this? And then very, I, and then very, I raise very, it. You know, and then I raise it up in the air and I say, hello, Angelina, how's the, how's the red carpet lock going? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I, I, these are just silly little things, you know, but just how, how might things be used? But I like the well, price I range. So yeah. do I. <laughs> yeah, 99, 99 cents and a piece of Velcro. That's You're it. so playful. It's great. <laughs> I like it. And All right, so they're wonderful, lots of great yeah. stuff. Let's get to some of the concerns, starting with some that have been mentioned in the chat room. Nelly was asking, so who's, who's, who, how much was the military involved in the development of this technology? Uh, well, ostensibly always, but before military, there's always pornography. So, <laughs> um, and, and that's serious. The, the pornography industry uh, switched um, its field of view uh, and its marketing context to a uh, first person perspective a long time ago and in doing so it opened up a new market but it also opened up a different type of behavioral um, shift in humanity that um, perhaps has seen has been very much to the detriment of um, the subject and Steve Mann is, uh, Professor Steve Mann is very quick to point out that some of the concerns that are being raised are around the rights of the subject, the rights of the person who is within the field of view of these particular consortium connected devices. And just coming, having come back from my, from a visiting researcher role in Finland, I experienced much the same thing within a different uh, cultural context. And when, posed, when I posed various scenarios around how these devices might be used in a, an affirmative uh, public or otherwise context, I was greeted with some fairly hostile um, feedback. Along the so military, don't ever wear those in this country? That was one of them. That's correct. You're not welcome in my country if you do wear a similar device uh, or that the subject uh, in this case is everyone so therefore how do you ask permission to uh, on a running level to be able to record audio video and transmit that live into another juris geographical uh, uh, jurisdiction particularly when those particular connections and streams are, in are intercepted for military um, uh, intelligence so well, what the if, military, military question is, is very uh, pertinent. I mean, what if, if, the, if the, we were talking about cell phones, you know, with cameras on them, uh, these also, you know, face similar issues? 
and um, I, I think, have, yeah. I think, don't you think they're going to be just uh, say ten years from now, this will be a passe conversation? Do you think? I think so, and I've just written a paper about that and released it for the ISTAS 13, where I, where I, instead of, from a researcher perspective, if you put the data in the center of the circle and think of the data as the output rather than putting the paper as the output, the publication, the same thing is going to happen with our cell phones and these particular wearable cameras and devices that are actually multi-sensor devices. The Google Glass device is actually connected to your jawbone and audio environment. The terms of service of glass are that there are, there's really only meant to be one wearer, uh, and that the if the if the devices then move to another wearer, that they can demobilize that unit under their terms of service. So essentially, you're leasing the device; you're not purchasing it. So if you think of our mobile phone, we still have some autonomy as to what we can do with that device. Yes, the service provider can turn it off, but I can hand my phone as we do in various cultures. And that phone becomes part of the community and various people use the phones at various times. So perhaps that right, that fundamental right will shift. And most importantly, I think, is that uh, this, this concept of the clunky whole handheld uh, for things to be interacted with is going to disappear very fast. And yes, Vance, I agree with you. I think this conversation will probably be redundant within two or five years' time. I don't know, maybe the, the question about that particular hardware, but I think the issues have been around a while. I don't mm. see the privacy issues uh, disappearing. Um, and and it's balancing the rights of the wearer versus the rights of the viewed, I guess, among if, other things. If I could perhaps give a, a use case, when I go to the farmer's market and I have my Bob Dylan on with my cell phone attached and it's and I'm hanging out with people, with ten people, then I ask the person, "Do you mind if I, do you mind if I put you live on YouTube?" Mm. Uh, yeah. So it's a behavioral thing, not a technology thing. You know, it's very blatant to have something like this uh, pointing at you, but of course you have the field of view and all those things. So just mm. different. Well, it looks like it's a question of power because. Uh, shops install cameras on on by the ceiling and don't ask anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Schools install security cameras monitoring students uh, 24/7 or however much time they are there. Uh, increasingly, just cities install outdoor cameras and record everything that's happening at major intersections. But this is uh, now individual people doing it, and somehow it's different. Uh, so. So it's a question of who can do it to what groups of people, what individual people. Speaking of which, Dave, I'm wondering if you can share Bonnie's take on this. Mm. Dave, you're muted. Still muted. Dave? Mm, not live there. Dave? Sorry, I was, I was coughing, so I had uh, both of my mutes on. <laughs> so I unmuted the first one and started talking and uh, didn't help at all. Uh, so we were talking this morning, uh, Bonnie Stewart is my partner, she's a PhD student at the University of Prince Edward Island, writes on all kinds of stuff in all kinds of places. Uh, and she heard I was coming in here this morning and said, yeah, that's another thing. And, um, one of the interesting parts about this is how it addresses the idea of gaze and culture, right? So there are some people who are allowed to look at other people and some people mm -hmm. who aren't. So you're allowed to look at different kinds of people in a culture. So for instance, I am totally allowed to look at a four-year-old who's playing in a park. I am not allowed to look at a 15-year-old who's playing in a park. Those are just things about North American culture. One of them is a perfectly normal activity for a North American male to smile at a four-year-old girl who's playing in a park. Doing the same thing to a 15-year-old is totally inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, but what it does is it forces us to take more honest ownership over those kinds of gays. So in different parts of the world, different parts of the culture, so different people in different classes are allowed to look at people in different ways. So in North American culture, we have a, a hidden class structure. We're not allowed to talk about it. It's not socially acceptable to discuss it. it still totally exists. But in other cultures where class is much more overt, um, mm. you'll end up with people from a certain social class who would never stare at somebody from say a higher social class walking down the street where the inverted is totally appropriate 
You can look at a workman who's hammering, um, who's working on a building for a half an hour, totally appropriate. Looking in the window at somebody who's working at their office desk would probably get you arrested. Mm. And I think that, it, that there's those, the dominance of particularly the male white gaze in our culture becomes a really important discussion when we talk about this kind of constant looking at people for whatever possible reason. Well, you know, cultural awareness, you know, it, I mean, that, that's just a, needs to be improved anyway. It could be, for instance, when I hang out with Islamic women, you don't see their face. Uh, they hide, and I didn't realize that at first, or surveillance, you know, different different things. So there's, I live in Southern California, there's a lot of people from Mexico, and I have to break them free of that cultural thing, like they won't look at me because that's disrespectful. But those are cultural things, not technology things, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think technology intermediates <coughs> and also interrupts and creates chaos amongst that. And so what I've experienced just in the last six months has been uh, even a minute level of marginalization by even introducing the, the topics of this particular um, always on recording mechanism from the perspective of the wearer. Somebody was mentioning there earlier about the, you know, the nature of cameras are now in everything. The idea that I'm very interested in as well is that, and I've had to de deal with my own university about this, in the university it's setting itself, we're quite used to, or the, the lecturers have become accustomed to being recorded by a surveillance camera that records the uh, lecture that people can access later for, for, la for later reuse, or at the time, streaming. But now the cameras are actually also pointing at the audience and the learners. And the learners can only interact with the uh, lecturer or the, the, uh, the educator by pressing a small black, black button on the table that's opposite them so that they can be heard audibly on the stream and that that's been enforced on an equity level. So what I'm interested in is what becomes of that setting when, when learners enter that environment wearing a camera that is also audio recording and when they assert the rights that they're recording for their own personal safety. If they state, I'm here, I'm wearing this device don't preclude me from this environment because I'm wearing this device for my own personal safety, not for entertainment, not for a lifeline capture, not for socialization, but simply for my own safety. What do we say back? Maybe, maybe related to that, I, I use a hangout in the classroom, mm -hmm. just for fun. In, so that means the, the people are giving itself. permission, they see themselves, they see their own actions, but it also gives the students in a very small setting, it gives them the ability to you know control the screen and do the other things and so it's not just uh, so they're more interactive with it of course we just turn the sound up because we can hear each other and it's a very small classroom it doesn't have 500 people in there no do do any of the students in that setting record you are they recording you from yes every, perspective? Every, every, that in our little little experiments right uh, then yes everything is recorded but only it's it's like a hangout permission hangout on the air. It's permission based. And I and, suspect you wouldn't mind if they had their own recording device and, and recorded you. I, I think the question is who gets to make those rules? The the case of, you know, McDonald's can videotape you, are you allowed to videotape McDonald's? Uh, no, are you're not. allowed to serve uh surveil the, the surveyors. Um where are we in, in terms of legislation? Is any of this legislated? And I, I imagine it's going to be legislated differently in different places. That's going to be a mess. It is. This, this introduces another level of um, legislation, much like uh, UAVs or uh, uh, unmanned aerial systems are at the moment between uh, domestic, commercial and military use. Uh, there's a, a lack of legislation around how they can be used. This is essentially the same. If you have on mass people descending on an environment, recording, transmitting live that environment in a non-obvious way, uh, it's bound to uh, break rules or break current legislation laws around privacy, uh, security, national security and other. Um, so the conference itself is, is a gathering uh, at an intersection, at a time, as you mentioned earlier, that is is really at the crossroads as to where this is actually going to go. Uh, the 
of the, the, the keynote presenters coming in from singularity from one side through to philosophy and uh, uh, even um, uh, the arts in all sorts of different ways. It's a collision of all of those different perspectives and, and anxieties of people around what this might mean, not only for, uh, for their interaction with their loved ones, but also what it might mean in their workforce, what it might mean uh, in, in the public. Um, we're, we're coming up to an hour, and we can certainly go over, but I, I want to make sure we get uh, whatever in that we want to get in, starting with anyone in the Hangout who hasn't had a chance to speak and would like to join in. If anyone has seen something in the chat that they would like to share, uh, please do so. Matthias, we haven't heard from you, or Michael? Maria? Uh, yeah, well, uh, at the moment I'm, I'm uh, giving lectures uh, in physics, and um, <laughs> One thing I was just thinking of, I think that many of the uses of Google Glass is, is sort of like uh, small, tiny use cases that you just don't think about at the moment. So for example, I was building my own document camera. Instead of buying a really expensive one, I used these kind of uh, physics laboratory equipment and an ordinary webcam. So, so I built my own document camera to be able to sit and, and uh, film uh, my, uh, my own handwriting uh, when I was solving some problems instead of uh, uh, using the projector for that uh, or, and, or writing at the blackboard. So for example, a Google Glass could be used, of course, as, as, a, as a document camera instead. Mm. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's, that's just one thing. But, but I know there are millions of things, I think, that I've come to think about. But, but that's just one thing that pops up in my mind. But the security questions and all, all that, I mean, I live in Sweden, and I guess uh, there mm -hmm. could be some different rules here, so I think uh, there will be. Uh, I guess that's also one of the points that that we get. That we get uh, many of the Google um, services quite late, since, since there are millions of different kind of rules and regulations. So I don't know even when we will get the possibility to, to use Glass in the end. And yet, some of Google's la largest servers exist in your country. And in, and yeah, in and I think actually Hangouts is developed in Sweden, so. <laughs> It is. That's <laughs> <laughs> great. And, and also, since we have a whole bunch of educators here, I'd, I'd love to hear any other thoughts about how this might be used uh, in education. We've heard a couple. Anyone else here or in the chat room have uh, thoughts on how we could actually use it for positive educational purposes? I, I have one more use case. I take my classroom in new product development into the field with you know, my little hotspot. I said, why do we have to be in a classroom, period? So let's go out to the park or let's go, if we're gonna do new product development, let's go get into the use field. And uh, yeah, we can actually hang out with devices and, and do those things as opposed to being confined to a building. So that's a, I, again, I, I just. I don't I don't know if you've seen the video uh, with the guys, the physics teacher, I guess, who, who went to CERN and uh, hang out from, uh, from within the CERN area looking at the huge detectors and so on, areas that are most probably restricted to most people. So you can actually bring, bring the students into areas and, and interact with them looking at, I don't know, interesting things. Wait, when, you, when you said physics, I was thinking of going up to the top of the building and dropping the phone off uh, to, so that they could uh, do the whole, uh, you know, experience it live. Um, I am, I'm doing a project, I'm doing a type of project called Math Track, where people go on scavenger hunts for mathematics. So we used to do it with photo cameras, just taking static pictures and then finding mathematics or writing stories. With this technology, uh, we are planning to do it live with people joining us on the math track from their homes and submitting ideas or submitting virtual models of what we find. So mm. uh, basically, hi, <laughs> basically um, uh, different um, enhanced mathematical experiences that people can bring if they are sitting at powerful computers while someone else is working in the field. I, uh, I think I have the... Le learning things, searching for things. I think one interesting use case would be, Rob, instead, to, instead of dropping one of these and using the, um, 
the accelerator and so on in this one. Uh, if there's an accelerator in the Google Glass, you should drop yourself from a plane and then plotting live, sort of like the, the speed and the position graphs uh, for the students in the classroom. So that, mm. that, I, I, that could actually have me jumping from an airplane. It was one of the cases that uh, Google did run with uh, Sergey yeah. Brin. was one of the first cases. Of that. I have been. Yeah. I have left a few devices, pivot head glasses with uh, base jumpers, and they're submitting some data back to me. So I can choose, and perhaps share that with you. What it what it is like to base jump. There are lots of point of view perspectives as to you can you, yourself feel the, uh, the the tension within that base jumper before as they prepare and as they jump. Uh, quite quite a, an emotive connection when it's from the person, the person, first person perspective. And, and someone else has put uh, a bird's eye view. I think I, I saw that on a hang mm. right? It was uh, yeah. a device attached to a bird, a device attached to a whale. Mm. Mm. And these, these, uh, were, these attachable wearable or um, as um, Steve will call bearable cameras, are part, very much part of our whole uh, uh, sense of humanity now. We have cameras embedded in just about everything. And it will be interesting to see how the technology evolves. You know, the, I was reading the, the iPhone came out, uh, next month will be six years, and it's hard to imagine life without smartphones now. And, they've, you know, there's a certain commonality, a certain difference. So it'll be, I, I hope competitors rise to... Uh, provide some diversity with uh, Google Glass. I'm also wondering, I'm sure Mac's going to get in eventually. I'm sure others have had this thought, but what would they call their wearable technology? The II? Eyeglass. <laughs> digital oh, digital eyewear. <laughs> some uh, threads in the chat are taking up things like um, uh, it, hacking the situation. I, I guess it occurred to me when you, uh, Alex mentioned that uh, only one person at a time can, or uh, this, this is owned by one person, you know, and that person has to wear it, otherwise Google will brick it. Um, but I'm just wondering how long it will take some school kid in Australia to crack that one, you know, I mean, they, they cracked the national network in about six hours. But I mean, there's a lot of hacking, uh, uh, you know, I mean, this, these things are, I think are just out of control. and. Uh, Someone mentioned in the in the text chat um, that if the cameras, you know, if, can you prevent? I mean, you know, can you block other people's cameras? Can you somehow uh, create interference that would prevent people from filming you? I mean, this seems to be an, another logical next step. Anybody Shields thought up. about that? I know how you do that. You you take a mailbox and you put it over the device. I did. Oh, that. But it would have to be someone else's device. Yeah. Or, but in in other words, uh huh. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I, I think just electronically, can you jam it, for example, to keep yourself being observed or uh, just things that people will be thinking about. It's another issue that I haven't really heard or, or, mentioned. Or, be, or better still, even that instead of blocking it, we, we disrupt the signal that they have back by um, perhaps becoming a QR code, our, our, our wearable uh, clothing and the objects that we carry are triggers which jam their signal. Mm. So um, our augmented reality is very much about what's present visually in a way that changes the interface for the, the other user. So what sorts of symbols or signs or ciphers or <coughs> um, objects can we adorn that will jam this, um, this onset? Wearable yeah, technology yeah. blockers. Yeah, jammers. <laughs> wearable jammers. <Yeah. laughs> wearable jammers. That's it. Yeah, that's it. There are a couple of questions that I coined before I got here. One of the ones that, that um, uh, stands out to me that we haven't yet answered, and that is around data. So the question was, given the terms and conditions of the providers who govern the use of the device, um, who actually owns the data? So do we have a, you know, because the data is a whole range of uh, sets of information, not just simply a photo without other uh, attributes of data. Who actually owns it? If it's being captured through a Google Glass device, does Google own that 
data or because I'm paying for the use or lease of that particular device, do I own the data? Uh, can they use that unconditionally in a, in a national security context or can they use it commercially without my permission? How can I assign GFDL to my or CC BY to the images I take through a Google Glass device? And, and I, I'm so not on. clear on the, the nature of the difference between taking a picture with my smartphone and one with Google Glass. Neither am I. <laughs> That's the question. Because uh, it can have geodata associated with it. Yes, geodata. Uh, proximity to other um, users of Google Glass. So if we think of Ingress, uh, I don't know if you've played Ingress, Google Ingress. Uh, if I'm near a portal and I'm assigning metadata to a portal, which I notice they don't do, and there's a great deal of educational uh, benefit that could happen there too. Currently, ingress portals in Google are very, very devoid of metadata. They could be linked into Wikipedia articles around a port portal device, a generally large cultural um, objects uh, or important locations or sites. So just picture Google Glass as being an extension of Google ingress and uh, the multitude of educational opportunities that there are to assign uh, time and space to a location and describing that from the perspective of the wearer, not just in text, but a live audio, a la uh, an interaction of different wearers coming to that one environment. Uh, that's one thing that comes to mind for me as a positive. Well, I think the answer to the question is we would like to own the data, please. Uh, I'm curious what Google's license is now. They have the kind of trial sets out. Do you know anything about the licensing there? Whereabouts in whereabouts in your current G plus photos can you assign various licensing conditions to your data? And where can you you can liberate your data by taking it away, but what happens? It's only a copy of the data. You don't own it. The data is actually still part of the framework of that 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 is composed to provide Google Photos. So there is a there is a I believe a large data provenance question around, particularly around this particular device type. Not only that, but also devices such as Autographer, which is actually a Microsoft associated uh, long time history product, and, and also providers like uh, Momoto, uh, which are, I believe from Sweden as well, Matthias as well. So these people will be questioned uh, intensely about this at this ISTAS 13 event. Uh, I'm very interested in the data conversation. Who owns it? Well, they, they, you know, that whole, we... that whole situation on intellectual property rights and, and all the other things you've brought up with cultural differences, legal differences, mm -hmm. and all those types of things, it's, that's intellectual property. And, you know, they've been dealing with that issue. It, they never resolved that issue. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like your opinion. How many opinions are there in the is world? The, <laughs> the dominant the ones. Between, uh... Is there a difference between uh, the intellectual rights rules for, say, a Google document or and uh, a picture taken and added to Google Plus? I thought they were sort of like making the same rules to rule them all. <laughs> Which is, uh, yes, uh, the proximity data will be an interesting one too, because who actually owns the live GIS version of where we cl where we cluster and, and uh, come in contact with each other. So our heat cluster maps of where Google users frequent um, around events. Who owns the proximity data uh, for that? Is that a commercial product? Uh, can we tap into it and can we hack it and reuse it? Um, or is that only owned by and do government want to get involved? Itself? I think they already are. I don't think there's a question of that. It's just how they're involved and to what extent that changes the nature of how we interact with each other as educators particularly. Uh, and also what it might mean for our learners as they congregate in spaces, as they capture data and as they essentially reveal what we don't want revealed uh, uh, quickly and rapidly everywhere. So as the, as the normalization of the wearable technology becomes trendy, fashion and hip, not just a novelty. Um, what does that do? What does that mean for our? You no, know, you know, on the on that uh, on that 
topic of location. I like hot food trucks, and they were banned here. So I said, why couldn't I have an opt-in, you know, uh, an opt-in locator of where my customers are? If I owned a food truck, I would know where those clusters are in the field, and whether that's at a MetroLink or public station is long, is long with a technology like uh, Latitude. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's a cluster of my whatever, my students, my customers, my whatever. And that's pretty close with Twitter, but that's Twitter-based. You know, you need to do an input to do that and with Latitude mm-hmm. you know, or that mm-hmm. technology. I mean, that's been around for a long time. Yeah. I'd like to bring up one more case that didn't come up, and that's children. Think of the children. Uh, because uh, that, that has to do with data restriction too. Because, for, for example, right now, a 12-year-old legally cannot own a Gmail let alone do a lot of other things. They do it, they get online, they are just uh, pretending to be not 12 or however old they are. So uh, what about this tech and children? Uh, That's very interesting. It's powerful technology and how will children be empowered with it or regulated or excluded? That's a big thing on my mind. To that that topic, um, do you know where your children are? But should your children be able to ask, where is mom at? Or in fact, to look at their mother and say, is this my mother? So we get to see children wearing Google Glass, but I would imagine with every other technology that we have had, and we've seen young children, very, very young children, um, using mobile phones and tabletware for a long period of time. So perhaps, if it becomes fashionable or normal for, for, for adults to be wearing a glass-based device, maybe perhaps even children, it would benefit them to be wearing them too. Again, cultural, intellectual property, all those things rolled up. Who knows where it's going to end up? And the point was made earlier in the chat room about how is this going to affect neural development. And certainly if it starts that young, I mean, that can really... You know, I was freaked out a little bit when Steve was saying, and I don't know if that's still the case, but like he's looking at the world upside down in order to make sense of it. Um, can, I draw, can I draw your attention exactly to what you're talking about there in terms of the conditions that Google Glass have, and I'll put it in the chat. Google Glass has under its terms and conditions, can everyone use Glass? And it says there, Glass is not for everyone. Like when you're wearing glasses, some people may feel an eye strain or get a headache. If you've had a, had LASIK surgery, ask your doctor about the risks of eye impact damage before using glass. Don't let children under 13 use glass as it could harm developing vision. Also, kids might break glass or hurt themselves. In Google's terms of service, don't permit those under 13 to register a Google account. If glass is not for you and, for you, and, and you wish to return it, do so before the end of the applicable refund period. So. That the point of children and under 13 year olds owning the device has already been covered, thought through. Kind of amazing. The country will let a five year old have a gun, but an 11 year old can't have Google Glass. 13, yeah. They can, they can print a gun. They can <laughs> <laughs> and send it elsewhere, that's right. Well, they can print glass. Hey, what Matthias I'm interested is on the road. Guys on the right, that's what I like to see. Now turn the camera the yeah, other that's way. Right. Not at you, but <laughs> Let us see what you're seeing. What, yeah, exactly, and that's what we're going to become accustomed to. What, I, what I'm very interested to know from people that are gathered here now, if you reflect deeply on your own current life, on your own current way that you interact with technologies in this way, can you yourself picture yourself wearing a camera that produces a life log timeline like a photo album uh, every day. Can you picture yourself wearing a camera within the next couple of years all day long? No. That's a yes? I think yes. That's a yes. <laughs> Matthias is saying yes. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because I have met with Kahul Garan, who is has currently been wearing this autographer and sense cam two for the last five years. Uh, he claims in my audio recording of his discussion, which was of a new novelty for him because he doesn't generally get recorded, is that uh, 
he has not yet experienced any great anxiety or uh, conflict yet of wearing a pendant based camera which is in his ch on his chest level just here he call he claims that he is a search engine guru he is not a privacy expert and I've also met with Gordon Bell who's the the uh, speaker for uh, the keynote uh, dinner banquet speaker at Distas 13 who's been wearing the same sort of camera for the last 25 years so um, It'd be interesting to see how Matthias's, what Matthias's uh, life log will be like in the next couple of years when I tap into it. You will see me removing two billions of these yellow flowers. What are they called? <laughs> in my lawn right now. Like number one, number two. Number <laughs> Dandelions? No, I don't know. I don't remember. Whatever. So that answers, you know, that, answers, that answers that question. But some people haven't some people haven't um, answered that one and I wonder if I wonder if the answer truly is if it becomes fashionable for other people or if it becomes part of my workplace expectation perhaps if it becomes just normal I will be wearing a particular camera or device and that will become part of my life and I think what we're at this year and into 2014 is the dawn or onset of that type of human behavior well, I mean, I can it, see wearing it sometime. I, I just don't want to wear it all the time. I mean, I can see it having some functionality, but, I, I, and I, I, you know, some people would wear it all. Just like, I mean, how many people, you can do all sorts of life blogging now, but, you know, some people document every day. A lot of people just kind of once in a while post something. Yeah, I'm thinking in terms of Facebook or Twitter, you know, uh, Twitter, for example, has changed uh, my usage of Twitter. I suppose, and probably most people's, has changed. Uh, we used to say things often. Now I don't know. You, don't, you just don't feel the urge anymore. And here again, you could hook up your life logger to a Twitter feed, or a, uh, you know, this. You could automatically post it to. Uh, I guess you'd have to have a, a different service for that. You know, um, you know, um, always on book or something like that. You know, so people who are interested in that kind of thing. I mean, there's so many permutations. And I, I suppose in my own case, I would just feel it was a nuisance and a, and a distraction to what I like to experience life. And, uh, you know, I don't know what I do with all the data. I would probably pick times I was going to do it. Like a colleague, for example, uh, f uh, has a camera on when he drives in Dubai and he produces some very interesting, outrageous driving photos. Um, but that's kind of a time when he decides he's going to life log. Um, might be any of those pictures could be his last <laughs> the way they drive in Dubai. But uh, in any event, you know that's I, you know. I, 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 but I, but I'm also aware there's there's somebody, for example, who was was under surveillance by the U.S. government. I'm sure it was that government, and they were inter they were bothering him so much that he started life logging and sending the data to the FBI and just trying to overwhelm him with data and then he and uh, i have heard about him on on the media perhaps or one of those uh, podcast programs and um so you know there's another aspect of you know just trying to it, it, i don't know it gets kind of ridiculous i suppose i don't know if it's ridiculous or not uh, we'd have to say i'd have i mean i can't judge steve mann for example who's been doing it for you know half a century i would think so mm -hmm. um yeah, I don't know why he does it. But I I think me, I it would be, I think it would be more interesting to see use cases of communities and groups and tribes doing this purposefully together, and big mm -hmm. data interacting in some structured and purposeful manner, assisted by computers probably and community leaders and curators, because live streaming, yeah, you get. Twitter fatigue or Facebook fatigue from just doing random things, it uh, the novelty wears out, but it can be purposeful, it can be serve pro purposes of collaboration or even collective action. I believe so, especially when you consider that it can be coupled with a multitude of other data sources, such as if you are not only capturing what you're interacting with seeing and doing you're also monitoring your heart rate hydrostatic pressure 
your pedometer, how many steps you're taking and so on. Perhaps the services that we have in terms of medical uh, intervention or perhaps choice uh, will be differently mediated as to what they have been in the past where we pay to sit in a room, we pay to talk to somebody who gives us a very conditional based non-data related output based on their own observation. Uh, they then have to send us to other environments where they have to scan us to be able to get other information which we could have already given them. So it's a rain, I, I see it as a data relationship that we could be fostering uh, with services uh, now um, uh, in a beneficial way, but we have to be very, very careful about um, what we're volunteering in what way to what service and how people could use that for other uses other than beneficial ones, of course. And I've put a link in the, the uh, chat there. Uh, there's a blog, very good blog post there from Autographer that shows how the future of life logging and these multi-sensor based devices and data types are coming together. Uh, Gordon's picture there, he's an elderly man. He wrote a fantastic book called um, uh, I don't have the actual title of the book in the back of my mind, uh, Life Bits, My Life Bits, and, uh, and the, the project that he talks about is the point where he said, look, the, the scanner's been invented. Why am I keeping all this paper around? When he just set off on a journey of decoupling his books, scanning the whole lot, and saying, I want to rid myself of all this this peripheral, this this past life, so I can move into the, the current life, which is digital media and digital data. So people treat it very differently. Uh, Nellie's comment reminded me of another question I had. She was saying she's looking forward to the day where you, you wear technology uh, into clothes. Um, on one of the documentaries about Steve, they mentioned you know wearable technology and implant implanted chips. And I wanted to know, is is that still science fiction, or is that somewhere on the horizon as well? Uh, are you talking about Uber valence as in transdermal in, in humans, or are you talking about within clothing and so no, on? No, I'm talking, I, my curiosity is transdermal. Uh, it's a very, it's a current reality. It's not a, it's not a science fiction whatsoever. Um, there are many different types of prosthetics that people uh, in a medical, in a medical intervention from brain computer interfacing with deep brain stimulation for all sorts of reasons where uh, people are, um, uh, have, have patented uh, objects which are part of their, I mean my mother is a walking cyborg when she sits down and actually thinks for 10 minutes about it. She says, Alex, I have, I have two hips that are fake. I have a brain, I have a, a, a heart stent and I have um, a range of other implants that make me something different than being a human. And I feel that way. I feel very different because, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, this perhaps wouldn't, I wouldn't be living this long. And so I'm, I'm becoming a different person by that. But there are examples of blood passports coming into Australia for sports uh, people where they are not only thinking about just GPS bracelets and blood alcohol bracelets for criminals, but also for blood passports, which are a small chip, which is inserted under the arm, much like a pill that uh, a lot of females get for for um, fertility. And that blood ch that little chip is an RFID environment that gives away data that can monitor the bloodstream and tell whether that particular sports person uh, has been digesting uh, or has had been digesting um, stimulants or titrates that are banned by various agencies. So it's, it's, it's a and as far reality. as neural integration, am I going to be able to learn a foreign language by planting it in? Uh, well, it's interesting that you say that when you look at the interaxon product and what that might mean, there's a range of different, I'll just put that into the uh, chat there. It's a very basic uh, Examples of interaxon that allow the second half of glass to come to, to, to fruition. So when I think that I want to take a photo, it takes a photo. I don't need to wink or say, glass, take a photo. Essentially, it maps those particular 
parts of the brain that allow me to command that function. So uh, if you can imagine that being on the back half of your skull and interacting with your brain, then these uh, technologies are, are just part of an interface with command and you know on off simple commands whether implanting language and cultures is <laughs> that's a very different matter this is what we're doing here that's pretty far out uh, all right well why don't we head into the home stretch uh, Alex any questions sure. we we haven't tackled on that list or anything else you want to address uh, Probably just the last question there is, is one that we need to think about. What are the ethics involved in patenting thoughts as collected by wearable tech? If the genome can be patented, then what about spontaneous thoughts? Then you know, it's been added in there, but I think that's very important because I think that's it's not that far it's not that far out. It's not that far away. Um, Thought-based processing and what we control and what we are. We call, our, we call that to be our private spiritual space. But I think that these devices are becoming closer and they're becoming more like an exoskeleton that we're part of a corporate exoskeleton. And we have to be careful about what the ethics are behind this. It's a very tricky question. When, as soon as you put the word ethics in there, people, people it's worse than privacy and better. So it's a matter of um, <coughs> my personal perspective on these is very different to other people's perspective on these. I would like to think that I could utilize these technologies in a normalized way for an educational positive outcome. Uh, I'd like to be able to map what those particular user uh, scenarios would be and to apply those within an educational context. Whether the organization can accommodate that um, at the moment is entirely clear uh, for me. Uh, I'm not able to do so um, to any great extent. Whenever I um, talk about data, I talk about um, the ability to manage uh, life logging as a um, as an RPL activity, uh, the ability to um, create video personal video portfolios that are user controlled, not corporation controlled or organisation controlled, um, without losing the IP of that data and keeping it private. They're fantastic challenges that'll keep me going for another decade worth of employment, I'm sure. So any other uh, points? I think this is the revolution. I, I just want to backtrack. You said the answer for yourself is no. That it is. It, it can. But what was the question again? Can can, can this can stuff be? Well, can educational organisations um, equitably handle the data? Okay. Uh, and do so in such a way that it makes it easy and makes it manageable for for a learner to uh, create a life log that becomes a relationship with the educational organization rather than being subject to courseware, subject to preclusion, subject to um, you know, sorting. Uh, can the learner enter into a, a relationship with an educational organization and, and volunteer data uh, that's being captured in there every day as that, uh, that is collected using these uh, device types? Um, but they can hire you to help them sort it out. Hopefully. <laughs> my, my, my contract ends in three weeks. I'm happy to my, do my, uh, little, little, uh, In my humble opinion, I, I, I've always wanted to be as many of us have Socrates on a cell phone or Socrates with a, and so the relationship is between the learner and uh, if, you could, if you could imagine uh, Socrates talking with you in a little hangout like this. And it's and it doesn't need an institution. I like Socrates. I, I don't like I don't like the idea of the Plato side of the conversation. Yeah, or well, five hats or the others. There's been a range of um, yeah, I, and, 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 and of course we 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 know that well, we know that we don't know because Socrates didn't really write it down anyway, right? So, <laughs> uh, any Ingenuity. closing thoughts from anyone? Uh, Nelly's asked a question, how does an artist fit in with this type of technology, kind of technology? Well, uh, from coming from an arts background, I can see a great deal of fantastic interventionist work. Uh, some of the early uh, Howard Rheingold swarm, uh, smart mobs and swarm-based 
uh, activities would be fantastic. But I also I like to think of the artist as being an interventionist as well as a reflection. So uh, there's a great sort of creative enterprise that could be employed by this data. And her other question, educational institutions are far behind. Will wearable cameras bring them in faster? My guess would be no. I think it'll cause them to slam the brakes on even harder. Yeah, and there has been a lot of uh, talk from mobile MOOCs, M MOOCs, about where Google Glass and other devices such as ITAP fit into that whole uh, mediated reality um, space and whether in fact they can or whether we're still stuck in uh, you know, module-based uh, learning. I think it might be the uh, prevalence of alternative, you know, uh, not so much the institutionalized education, but mm -hmm. online alternatives or other options. My like hope points. is, my yeah, hope is ahead. this will promote co uh, collective learning and group learning in communities and networks. Homeschoolers, free schools, higher education mm -hmm. like MOOCs, uh, this sort of thing where people together form around the data, around smart computer tools, and institutions can keep up or get, get, get out, basically. <laughs> I've, we I've we all heard of it. I'm about, I'm about four weeks into uh, Tina Selig's Stanford MOOC, uh, and it's interesting, but the most interesting portion of it is that we hang out, um, mm. and uh, that's where the learning occurs in small groups to me, and it really doesn't have too much to do with her system. It's just no. the hangouts that that make the learning for me. And I have. I'm a left brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, or have been a left brainer, but I aspire to be a right brainer. Mm -hmm. Right. Matthias Vance, any closing thoughts? I'm just excited to see what 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 uh, will happen. Uh, and in Sweden, I mean it feels like we're a bit behind when it comes to the integration of technology. So I guess this this is still quite a bit ahead of us. But um, so so. But I like being on the edge of looking into the possibilities anyway. So I'm keeping an open mind and then two eyes open. And we'll look forward to picking the dandelions with you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll post many times a day. I think there are a lot of them. I think this is a future of learning in a networked world, which is one way I was interacting with Alex and Michael, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, this is. Uh, I think I think I, I sort of see a uh, a concatenation of tools. And uh, Maria just mentioned uh, smart tools, smart technologies. And if you look at MOOCs, how MOOCs are scaling. Um, uh, you know, education has scaling. What we can do with education. One of the problems that was mentioned earlier was that uh, having all the data requires something that scales in order to curate or in order to make sense of it. So I think those technologies will develop. Um, talking about how, I mean, we're talking about analytics. You know, learning analytics. Well, you can you can combine this kind of data with some sort of analytics and some sort of system where uh, I could en envisage it a lot better than I could sit down and script it. But uh, anyway, that's the kind of thing that I would picture coming together. I, I sort of see that the, um, uh, my, I would imagine that a lot of the ethical issues that, I mean, well, they'll, they'll always be there, obviously, but as these technologies get more and more understood and people are aware of them and take them more and more for granted and they start cropping up in our uh, televisions that look back at us, you know, or that we, you know, anyway. But, you know, so. Uh, We'll sort of accept this. Uh, it, it'll just become integrated with uh, a lot of de-schooling, start uh, catching some of the kids who are being left behind right now, you know, so picking picking things up. Uh, I see mm. a, a great democratization. Mm, uh, mm. I've been disappointed before, though. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Jeff, I'd just like to thank you uh, for facilitating the discussion tonight. Um, primarily because it, it reaches out across a network of uh, deep thinkers who are connected um, in a cultural, uh, educational and, and other um, domain. And that's very important to bring this is actually a resource that will be brought forward into the G plus community for uh, violence, uh, the domain, 
not surveillance the discipline. And um, the, we do, uh, you will see a great deal of data come out of that particular event in Toronto. And uh, if you do happen to be around, around the Canada Day celebrations, then please come to Toronto and be part of that as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, Alex, for, for asking me to do this. I learned a lot preparing for it, and I learned a lot tonight. Uh, I want to thank everyone who participated and everyone who tuned in. Uh, please keep tuned in because the revolution is coming and it will be humanized. Uh, I will say so long for now. Thanks again, and we'll uh, look forward to continuing the conversation next time.